Welcome to Olive Branch Baptist Church. We're so happy that you are with us this morning. Uh, Let's go ahead, let's stand up together, and let's begin our morning with worship. There's an endless song waiting to be sung with the voice of every tribe, the sound of every tongue. When the bride of Christ on that day of days brings with joy unto the Lamb a multitude of praise, and like the roar of mighty seas and rolls of thunder, hear his people sing. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! For the Lord Almighty reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God. Tell with great rejoicing all the wonders God has done. And like the roar of mighty seas and rolls of thunder, all the church will sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord Almighty. Our God, the Almighty Reign. In certain of the day, Christ we will proclaim. Oh, the more would we'll share the prize, salvation in His name. The greater will the anthem ring, a mighty chorus rising to the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord Almighty reigns. Hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord our God. Almighty reigns, hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Great job this morning, amen to all of that. Let's, uh, you know what, before we get to the announcements, you've got a neighbor that's near you who braved the rain, and I don't know what the temperature is anymore, but go ahead, say good morning to a neighbor, and uh, we will get to the announcements here in just a sec. All right, as we start making our way back to our seats, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a whole lot of announcements this morning. So, but we do have a few. I encourage you to check out the bulletin and see uh, everything else that uh, is not included in the announcements. Uh, we only got a few today. Uh, Wayne is currently at the walk to Emmaus, so you are uh, stuck with me today, which I always say that if it's a bad thing, maybe I should be positive and see it as a good thing. Eh, humility, why not? We'll take that. Uh, but uh, he'll be back uh, next week with us, but just pray that he uh, had a good time, that he gets back uh, safe this evening. Uh, but if you are a guest, uh, let us know that you're here by filling out a Connect card, which is in the seat in front of you. Or you can scan the QR code on the back of your bulletin, which you uh, got when you came in. If you still need a bulletin, we have plenty in the back, and uh, you can get one of those. Uh, and also, do not forget, guests, that we do have a gift bag in the back uh, near our uh, lovely camera crew, and you can get that on your way out the door today. 
I got to give Will a shout out. Uh, Women on Mission, you are meeting today at 2 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. So if you did not remember that, here's your reminder to put it on the calendar. So be in the Fellowship Hall at 2 o'clock. Uh, tonight at 6, Jason Runnels is going to be here. Uh, totally free concert. Uh, we will be taking up a love offering for him and his ministry. If you have listened to the Gaithers before, uh, you, will, you probably will uh, recognize the music. Uh, so help get the word out for that, and we hope to see you tonight at 6. And then last but not least, uh, the Mets, they are meeting, uh, to, or not today, their last day to sign up is today, uh, which you can do in the Welcome Center, or you can go on the Olive Branch website or on the app, and you can sign up for it uh, this uh, this coming Thursday, the spring concert is going to be led by uh, Lacrosse Elementary Chorus with our very own Elizabeth Taylor leading that. And I heard that there are grilled burgers, which is enough for me to want to go. So make sure you sign up for that. Uh, we'll have a great meal and we'll have a great time uh, fellowshipping together. So like I said, make sure you check out your bulletin for a lot of more things coming up. Uh, one big thing is we still have a VBS uh, sign-up sheet that needs to be signed up in. So uh, if you are interested in helping out with VBS, uh, please do so or let us know by signing up out in the Welcome Center. And also registration for VBS did uh, go online this past week. So for my, I think I want to say pre-K through fifth graders, you can now register for VBS if you have not done so already. So uh, that is everything that we've got. Let's stand up together and let's continue to worship. In the morning as I pray for the day that you have made, I have hope and I have peace, for your presence is with me. So whatever comes my way, Lord, remind me of this grace. I can face it with this hope. Jesus won't forget his own. Jesus holds me safely in his hands Ever close he leads me in his plans When I can't see the way I have hope and I have faith day after day Jesus reigns In the evening as I rest, I recall your faithfulness, how you never left my side from the morning to the night. Now until the dawning sun, be the light that leads me on, I can face it with this hope, Jesus won't forget his own. Jesus holds me safely in his hand. Ever close, he leads me in his plan. When I can't see the way, I have hope and I have faith day after day. Jesus reigns. Glory of the Lord, and if the day should test 
my faith or fill my heart with songs of praise I can face it with this hope Jesus won't forget his own Jesus holds me safely in his hand Never close he leads me in his plan When Hope and I have faith day after day. Jesus reigns day after day. Jesus reigns. So I took Benji to his first concert last night to see Phil Wickham, which he uh, was looking forward to a lot, I think. But he didn't realize that uh, there's such a thing at concerts known as opening acts. And when he did not know a single song from the opening act, after the very first song, he says, Dad, I'm kind of bored. I think I want to go home now. Phil Wickham comes eventually, and he's, uh, you know, he plays three songs. And three songs in, he's like, Dad, I think I'm good. I think I want to go home now. <laughs> And I said, bud, these tickets were 80 bucks. You are good when I say you are. <laughs> and stayed we did. <laughs> anyway, so I just thought that was funny. You know, you can uh, look forward to some things for so long, and then it's like, yeah, I think I want to go home. But uh, the day is going to come when we get to see our Lord face to face, where we will be home, and we're never going to have to say, well, I'm kind of bored. So I look forward to that. So uh, let's continue to sing together. I should pray, play it right. I was buried beneath my rebellion, lost without hope of redemption, blind to my need for a savior, oh, but God. And crushed by the weight of my failures Living the lie I created Digging my grave without knowing Oh, but God, oh, but God Rich in mercy, how you loved me Too much to let me stay lost my salvation sent from heaven, nailing my sin to a cross. Oh, but God, you gave me a truth worth believing. I traded my chains for your freedom. You were the one that I needed. Oh, but God. Resurrected my heart from the ruins My rescue came through like the morning Now this is my sure testimony Oh, but God, oh, but God Rich in mercy, how you love me Too much to let me stay lost My salvation Sin from heaven, nailing my sin to a cross. Oh, but God, all the wreckage of my choices, you have turned to life from ashes.
my salvation, sin from heaven, nailing my sin to a cross. Rich in mercy, how you loved me, too much to let me stay lost. My salvation, sin from heaven, nailing my sin to a cross. can have a seat. Amen. Oh, but God. Oh, but God, thank you. Thank you this morning for your mercy and grace. Out of the ashes and through the fire and through the storms of life, you brought us here this morning that we can worship and praise you, Lord. We ask this morning as we give our tithes and offerings to Share those and give those according to your will and use them to uplift your kingdom. May you be glorified in all that's done or said. Lord, that hearts and souls here this morning are touched by the word of music, touched by your life and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray and claim today your salvation is for us, is for our souls to spend eternity with you. To live a joyous life. Because there's joy that comes in the morning. Oh, but God, thank you this morning for your freedom. Freedom of life, love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to uh, take you through a little history lesson real quick. I understand history is not everybody's cup of tea, but I'm preaching today, so therefore you all enjoy history right now. I... In Easter Sunday, 1538, uh, way over in Geneva, uh, John Calvin, one of the greatest verse-by-verse preachers to ever pick up a Bible, uh, was ran out of town by uh, the church and the people of Geneva uh, due to a few things, nothing on Calvin's fault, entirely on um, just, just his view and his biblical support for the Lord's Supper of who should and should not be taking the Lord's Supper. In 1538, they ran him out of town. Three years later, in 1541, uh, Geneva realized, hey, we made a mistake, and they asked Calvin to come back, uh, which he did. And what I love about this, this is is how it all connects, is that he loved the Word of God so much, and he believed that the sequential preaching of the Word of God, verse by verse, was so important that when he got back three and a half years later, he picked up his sermon series on the exact next verse that he was going to preach three and a half years ago. So, all of this is to say, six months ago, I told you all that we would be going together through the book of 2 Peter. And six months have come, we went in six months, back in November, we did chapter one, here we are six months later, and we are getting into 2 Peter chapter two. So, if we look at Calvin, six months compared to three and a half years is not that bad. If you do not remember, uh, when we went through 2 Peter chapter one, you loved it. Just tell yourself that, I'm telling you that you loved it. It was the greatest sermon series I think you said you've ever heard. Grown men cried. Women loved their husbands more. Children were changed for the better. Cats and dogs lived in harmony. It was great. You loved it. Go back and watch it. You probably will just agree, you know, just say yes. So here we are. If to give you a little bit of a recap of what is happening, as Peter writes 2 Peter, the time of his departure, the time of his death is getting closer, and Peter is writing to remind his readers and ultimately us here in the 21st century of some important truths that you and I need to know. And so chapter 1 is a very positive chapter, very positive chapter. The second chapter, though, it's a total 180. It's very practical. It's very needed, but it does not carry with it the same positive tone that is found in 2 Peter chapter 1. Chapter 2 here is, is serves as a warning. It acts as guardrails to make sure that the church is, is pursuing true and proper faithful Christian teaching. Chapter 2, it's going to point to the danger, the presence, the judgment, and methods of false 
teachers. In these first 10 verses, which we'll go through uh, these first 10 today, and anywhere between four weeks and three years from now when we finish up the chapter, uh, we will see the methods of false teachers. But right here in these first 10 verses, I want us to realize the surety of God's sovereignty over these false teachers of of Peter's day, even further back as we're going to see, and of our day, the assurance that uh, they have not escaped God's sight. Right In these first ten verses, we will see that the presence and the judgment of false teachers, and uh, we're going to focus on those two things first, the presence of the false teachers and then the judgment, and then number three of what we'll look at this morning is the rescue of the righteous. So, Let's open up in prayer, and then we will dive into 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. So let's go to the Lord together. Heavenly Father, I pray as we go through these verses this morning that our hearts and our minds would be open. We know that uh, it is not easy to live the Christian life, especially when all these things are thrown at us that have the title Christian attached to us. I pray that we would have the ability and the strength and desire to discern what is true and what is right, and I pray that hearts and minds would be open today. It's in your name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 10. I'm getting old, so I need glasses to see the screen again. Here we go, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives afterwards, and if he rescued righteous Lot, opposed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation." and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Now in these first three verses, Peter warns his readers of the presence of false teachers that will make their way into the church, and he warns about what their intentions are. Now, as I said, these verses are a total contrast to what Peter had just said at the end of chapter 1. And so if you don't remember what that was, uh, these verses are in contrast to verses 20 to 21, at least specifically, where Peter says this. He says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Here we see Peter saying that no man has ever produced his own prophecy. And no scripture has ever been penned solely by a human author. Instead, God, who is truth, inspired the prophets, the other authors of scripture, to record for us the words that God wanted us to know. This is the uh, second Timothy 3 of God breathing out his word in so we know that nothing in the Bible was written from a purely human perspective. Man is not just throwing words at the page and God is like, yeah, I'll use them. No, these were God's intended words for the people of God. So Peter, what he does is he points back to the time of the prophets and into the Old Testament, writing and saying in verse 1 that false prophets rose up during their time as well. There were those in the days of of Jeremiah and in the days of Isaiah the prophet who would prophesy peace for the kingdom of Israel and for Judah when there was no peace. They would prophesy prosperity. They would prophesy love when when just exile and wrath were to come. So I'm going to give you a few homework assignments. I know it's the weekend. I'm sorry. 
One of the homework assignments that you have tonight is to go home and read uh, Jeremiah 23. Because it, like, time does not permit us to get into as much detail as I would like, but the words that the Lord has and says of the false prophets that came during Israel and Jerusalem's time, it, it's important for us to see, especially as it relates to 2 Peter chapter 2. What the Lord is going to say is that these ramblings of these unsent prophets, they've not just hit the streets of Jerusalem, but they have found itself in the very house of God. These ramblings are not just like standing out in the Walmart parking lot yelling at people. These words have come in to the people of God, into God's house. In Jeremiah 23, 16 through 17, the Lord says to his people, do not listen to the words of the prophets that are prophesying to you because they are leading you into futility. They're speaking their own imaginations and not my words. They say that no calamity will befall you because of your sin. A few verses later in, in verse 21, he says, I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. God did not send them. They had no word from the Lord. They spoke no truth. The very next verse, the Lord says, if they had been in his presence, then they would have spoken the truth. He says, but if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Now, for a moment, look at Jeremiah 23, 25 to 32. This is like, like if we, I had to, I could have gone through this whole chapter. This is what I think is most important for us in terms of what we see in Jeremiah 23. It all is important, but this is what I want us to, to be left with. Listen to what the Lord says of these false teachers. I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long? Is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood? Even these prophets of deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal? The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. Now here's where it gets good. What does straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare the Lord declares. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them to led my, and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boastings. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord. Nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit. There is nothing in the words of these false prophets that produced any benefit for anyone. Peter says it is teachers like this that the church in his day and the church of our day need to be made aware of. And just as there were false teachers and false prophets that rose up in the time of, of Moses and of David, Isaiah, all the Old Testament, there will be false teachers among us. And the first thing I want you to notice is how these false teachers come in. If you go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, notice Peter says that these are not the people, like I said, just shouting in the Walmart parking lot or shouting out in the streets. No, these are people that, that walk among us in the church. He says there will be false teachers among you, so that means that the church of Christ needs to be aware of that which is inside their walls. And how are they going to do this? It says right after that, that these people will secretly introduce destructive heresies to the people of God. Now, now realistically, then, this is what this looks like. What this means is that it is highly unlikely. I don't want to say it's impossible, because if you look at the state of, of certain denominations today, it might happen. I'll say it's entirely unlikely that someone is going to just walk in one day, get up on the pulpit, and say, bow down to Satan, that's how you get to heaven now. It's in the Bible, trust me. That is not what Peter is saying. Instead, it's going to start out really with a comment. 
It'll start out even with, with just a thought, maybe a word here or there. It might not even be a full-fledged teaching. And as Adrian Rogers would say, you know, they're going to use our words, but they're going to use their own dictionary to define them. And what's important for us to know is that the teachings of Satan are not always covered with, with pitchforks and horns being uh, rallied up by uh, you know, a band of demons and a bunch of fire running behind it, and, but instead it comes disguised as an angel of light. It will have the appearance of truth, but not be. And so practically it might sound something like this. Let's say hypothetically a teacher comes in and says, everybody, Jesus is love. Jesus is a God of love. Well, amen, that. that's true. And then he'll say this, you know, John 3, 16 for God so loved the world, well, if God so loves the world, which means it's not a little love, but it's a whole lot of love, like it's an unfathomable amount of love. So far, we're all still on the right page, right? Ultimately, then, there's so much love in Christ that lost sinners can't be lost forever, which I think then hell is temporary. Christ is so full of love that even they will eventually be saved. So what does that mean then, practically? Well, they would say, you can live how you want. You can reject Jesus if you want. You can reject his teachings if you want. You'll be saved eventually. You might have a few pounds, you know, melted off, but, you know, you'll get there in the end. Well, there's a danger in that, right? On the surface, that sounds really good. That sounds very optimistic. And we know the love of Jesus. We know the love he has for the world. We know there's a great multitude that will not be able to be numbered that will be in heaven. But do you see how destructive this heresy is that's disguised with all the language of truth in the Bible in it? This is a teaching that, that false Teachers will peddle to lead others astray. Peter then goes on to say that these teachers will deny the master who bought them, and, and, and right away, this has nothing to do with the atonement. This does not have anything to do with universalism. Instead, Peter is using this analogy to simply say that these men, despite their destructive heresies, are still under the sovereign authority of God. And as these heresies are introduced, Peter warns that that many people are going to follow them, and because of that, the way of the truth will be maligned. Now, these teachings, these are an attack on the truth of God's Word. It's an attack on the trustworthiness of Scripture, and it is an attack, it, it deliberately leads you away from true biblical Christianity. Look, we will know what is true in, in, in terms of Christianity and the teachings of those around us, because it will not stand contrary to what God has already spoken in his word. We can know the truth because it will not speak down on scripture, it will instead exalt scripture and what the Lord has to say. Your second homework assignment, and I, I told you, you know, look, I love old books, and I know old books aren't for everybody, but the best authors in the world are dead ones. Here's your homework. Go and buy or read, if it's free online, Jonathan Edwards' book, The Distinguishing Marks of a Work of the Spirit of God. What's important about this book is way back in the 1700s, we had this event known as the Great Awakening, uh, which was one of the, I'd say, probably the greatest religious revival, at le uh, definitely on the American side of things, but maybe even the greatest revival post-Pentecost. There were many people, we call them the old stuffy generation, uh, who were convinced that all these young people, because it was really started with the young people, that were being saved, it was just a show. It was, you know, emotionalism. It was this, that, and the other. Well, what Jonathan Edwards does is he goes to either Yale or Harvard, I forget which one it is, and he basically, point by point, shows how to make sure that what happened in the Great Awakening was a distinguishing mark of what God's work looks like. And, and one of the main things that he said as to whether or not something really is from the Lord or not is how it represents and exalts the truth of God's word. 
And so this is what he says. He says that if by observing the manner of the operation of a spirit that is at work among a people, we see that it operates as a spirit of truth, leading persons to truth, convincing them of those things that are true, we may safely determine that it is a right and true spirit. Now, here's the thing. If we are going to claim to be Christians, we need to know what is distinctly Christian. You and I need to know the truth. I think that one of the major issues with the church of today is we've really lost sight of what is true. And we have lost the desire, and we don't really, I think, even feel like we have a need to call false teachers what they really are. We've let the fire of orthodoxy burn to just a spark of what true Christianity is, and we have rejected doctrine in favor of application. I hear all the time, application, application, application. We need application. That's, that's, like, that's the only thing God only saves by application. I can give you 10 points on how you can be a great father. I can give you five points on how to be a good son. That's not going to save you a lick. Haddon Robinson used to say that there's more danger of heresy in application than there is in doctrine. Because it can be so easy to take things and say, well, just do this and attach the word of God to it. We have ignored blatant heresy and just let it run rampant because we don't want to offend anybody. Or we're afraid that if we call somebody out, they'll, they'll, they'll just not come back. You know, or we'll say, well, this person was helped by it. And like, you know, they kind of had this going for them. Look, we've lost the desire, and we've lost the ability to call an ace an ace and a spade a spade. Look, Satan's going to do all that he can to see to it that wolves in sheep's clothing are going to come into the pen. But I wonder, have we lost the desire to find the wolves and to protect the sheep? Because we're more concerned about how the wolves feel than about the safety and the destiny of our sheep. Look, the greatest need for the 21st century is, I'll very tiptoe this, it is not so much to weed out false teachers. We absolutely need to do that, otherwise this sermon will make no sense. We need to do that. But an even greater need right now is we need to bring out and bring forth true biblical teachers. We need men and we need women that know the truth, and if that truth offends, let it do so. We've been living in offense of God our entire lives. Let them be offended for a little bit. And it absolutely breaks my heart when I go to quote-unquote Christian bookstores or I look at the Christian section in uh, like, you know, take Ollie's down in Henderson, and I see just the garbage that's getting peddled out, which is just blatant false teachers. And I hear with people with such thankfulness and high regard for some of these people. No, we need to call those people out. We need to correct. Look, the prosperity gospel was one thing. That is a tool of the devil. And those that pushed for it are false teachers. The Joel Osteens, the T.D. Jakes, the Benny Hens, the Stephen Furtick's, Bill Johnson's, Copeland's, all these people, they are either false teachers plain as day or they are greatly deceived. You and I, Christians, we need to be careful with what we take in. And you need to check teaching with Scripture. I tell the kids at YC, look, I want you to tell me if I say something wrong. If I ever make a comment and it seems contrary to the Bible, I want to know about it. A while back, I was having dinner with, with somebody who is, a, a, I guess he's kind of a part-time worship leader. And, and we got talking about the state of worship music today. If you want a few-hour conversation with me over something, ask me about what I think of Christian music today. He asked me, because I, I told him this, I said, I refuse to play Christian artists, Christian artists like Bethel. I don't play Elevation. I don't play Hillsong. Because I believe that these churches are ultimately being led by false teachers. Just take Bethel as just the umbrella term, I guess. And this is what he said. He said something along the lines of, well, look, even if that's true, these songs, I mean, we're using them to lead people in worship. So really, I think we can look past some of these doctrinal things. And I was just 
perplexed because you and I need to understand that not only does God care who we worship, he also cares how we worship. John chapter 4, Jesus says what? God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So if I refuse to play music and support ministries that know how to make a song that sounds Christian, but will knowingly teach falsehoods to the people. And as I said, you need to remember that not everything that claims to be Christian is Christian. You can have a church, you can have the title church on the door and not be one. And you need to be able to discern what is true because the path of these false teachers leads to nothing but judgment and is a judgment that is sure and swiftly approaching. If it was swiftly approaching at the time of Peter, how much more so is it approaching now? These false teachers, Peter wants us to know, have not slipped through God's fingers. Peter says that their judgment comes from long ago, that it is not idle, and we don't have time to reread verses 4 through 8, but what uh, Peter says here is he uses three examples to show how God's judgment is sure, that, that there, there's no slipping through his fingers. And he uses the angels uh, that fell uh, prior to the fall in Genesis chapter 3, he uses the world that is seen at the time of Noah, and he also uses the example of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. So, uh, like I said, you know that before the fall of man, there is the fall of Satan. Uh, Genesis, before Genesis 3, at some point, Satan rebels against the Lord, and a number of angels follow with him, but they did not remove God from his throne. Jude uh, verse 6 says, the, And the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. The next reference, like I said, was the world during the time of Noah. This was a time when wickedness and falsehood was just running rampant. And the state of the world was so bad that it's described like this, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. We know that during the time of Noah, God sends a global flood which destroys the entire world. And you would think that if the world is destroyed, then falsehood and wickedness is one. But that does not happen because by God's grace, Noah and seven others are saved. And Peter wants us to know that Noah was a righteous man. And not only was he a righteous man, he was a preacher of righteousness. Noah preached the truth. He wasn't caught up with the, the winds of unrighteousness. He wasn't afraid of, of offending. Imagine if Noah's the pastor and he's standing out there warning the world, judgment is coming, repent, turn to the Lord and live. And they say, hey, you know what, that seems kind of offensive. I didn't like that. He you know, goes, oh, I'm sorry. Let me make this better. Let's, let's talk about you some more. He doesn't do that. Why? Because he's preaching the truth. He's not caught up with Wickedness. And then finally, Peter references the rescue of Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Now, of the entire population of those cities, only Lot and his daughters were the ones that escaped. But they didn't escape on their own. No, instead, the Lord rescued them just as he had rescued Noah. And righteous Lot's heart, it was for the people of Sodom, but not for the sins of the people of Sodom. What is it then that Peter wants us to recognize? It's this. It is that you cannot escape the judgment of God. Sin will not go unpunished. And those that make a practice of deceiving the sheep will not go about unnoticed, and they are not off of the hook for what they have said and what they have done. Those that have introduced destructive heresies to the people of God, that have indulged the flesh, that have despised the authority of God and have totally neglected the master who bought them, will be judged and destroyed. God's judgment is sure, and let me say this as well. There are many of us here who are in a teaching position. We have people who preach. We have uh, teachers. We have Sunday school leaders. We have uh, deacons. We have uh, maybe you lead a home group or a small group or something like that. No, many of you are parents who... who you want to teach your children. What is it that you're teaching? What are you teaching them? 
And what is it that they're taking in? Look, you and I, we need to make sure that we are teaching the truth. And this is why, look, just because you can speak doesn't mean that you can, you can just speak anything. You can talk pretty well, but that doesn't mean that you should be given a class. James 3.1, it, some of us, we see it in a negative. I see it as a positive. He says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. I know that the day is going to come when every word that I've uttered from this pulpit, a former pulpit, any future pulpit I might be, is going to be laid bare before the Lord. And I really, really hope that what I have said is true. Because you and I are not permitted to run free and loose with the Bible. And sometimes, look, sometimes you're going to teach false things just out of ignorance. I look back to when I preached my first sermon, and that is one of the greatest assurances of God's patience that I've ever seen, because he actually let me preach another sermon eventually. It was that bad. I didn't intend to teach things falsely. I was little. I was like 18. Surprised I knew how to read. You might teach things falsely, but there's something completely different about deliberately teaching falsehoods than lead people away. We all need, not just us that are in teaching positions, to check what we are reading, to check what we are listening to, to hold the preaching and teaching that we hear to a much higher standard. And what I mean is this. You guys need to like, hold me and Wayne to the highest level of accountability as humanly possible. I want you to hold us to such a standard of truth that we start sweating. Like, we want to make sure that we are preaching the truth. The last thing that I would ever want to do is lead someone away from the gospel. All of this means is that if we're checking what we are listening to, reading, teaching, this may mean there's some things in your life you have to check out. There might be some books, some podcasts you need to move away from. There might be a YouTube channel you have to unsubscribe to. We don't just need to bring truth in. We need to make sure that we're doing what we can to push truth out. Because we know that judgment is sure for every false teacher. Now, Peter does not leave us without hope. He goes through, uh, he, he mentions the fall of the angels. He mentions uh, the rescue of Noah. He mentions the rescue of Lot. And he uses those examples, and he reminds us of this. He says, if these things are so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Do you see what Peter's saying here with this? He's saying, look, if God can save Noah and if he can save his family in a world that is described as only evil continually, and if he's able to save Lot out of this wretched hive of scum and villainy that is Sodom and Gomorrah, then we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. So do we see what this means for us? Do we see what this means for the church? It's that it's in a world that seems to be like approaching levels of wickedness that even Sodom and Gomorrah might say, hey, that seems like a bit much. Like God sees those that have been made new in Christ and he knows how to rescue them. And while temptation and stumbling points are all around, God alone can rescue. Remember what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Yes, we are surrounded right now by false teaching. We're surrounded by false teachers, but shining in the darkness is the light of the world, and that light is the light of truth. And that truth which we hold to and which we proclaim, we know will never be destroyed. We're holding on to that which is eternal. And we are held by him that will never give up the throne. Going back to Calvin, he says this, he says, It is enough to remember that we must fight against unholy doctrines. We must fight. And that our faith ought not to be shaken by divisions and heresies because the truth of God will firmly prevail over all the turbulent upsets by which Satan has so often tried to overthrow everything. False teachers are going to try, but they have not slipped through the cracks. Their teachings will not stand. 
And as we start to close, I want us to have a little bit of encouragement. I remember I said earlier that 2 Peter 2 is not as positive as chapter 1. There's still some positive to get out of it. We have great warnings that we're mindful of. We're thankful for that. But there's positives both for believers and unbelievers of what I think we see in these uh, verses because I do think that both groups are represented now in this room. And the odds that, that every single person here right now is a Christian is not impossible, but it is probably unlikely. But for believers, I want you to know this. You see this world that you're in, and you see the hatred that this world has for truth, the hatred that it has for the Lord. We don't need to spend a lot of time preaching about the fallenness of the world. All you got to do to know that the world has fallen and that total depravity is a thing is turn on the news for three seconds and you're going to see a world that is not a glowing beam of righteousness. You will see a fallen nature. What do we do? Well, we stand firm and live confidently in the knowledge that just as the Lord rescued you from the sin that separated you from him in the first place, He will also rescue you from the judgment that is to come. He will rescue you from the pains of this world and the time is going to come when all that is sad is going to be made gloriously untrue. A time will come when falsehoods will fall and you will know in full because you will see the Lord as he is. And knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is coming, knowing that our ultimate rescue is sure, doesn't it make sense to live boldly for that truth now? Doesn't it make sense to call out false doctrine and false teaching with the full confidence that even if man is to kill the body, that Christ has already rescued your soul? And here's the thing. If if Christ has rescued us for eternity, really who cares what happens to our body in the temporary? If the greatest need is already covered, there's some things that we don't need to be as focused on. Should we not strive to preach the true and living word of God? Should we not strive to make sure that what we say and do is lined up with Scripture and truth? And let me lovingly challenge you to just double-check the content that that you are bringing into your life. I know that many parents, when, when at least I remember it was with my parents, when there was a new band I wanted to listen to, what was the first thing my parents did? They would pull up the lyrics online and they would go through and see, okay, that's okay. This is not okay. This is good. Should we not do that with what we are hearing taught in the name of God? Look, truth starts with the Lord, but it is his church that is to carry it out. And then finally, if you're an unbeliever, you need to know that if you do continue to deny Christ and choose your own sin, your own ways over obedience to and faith, then God's judgment does remain on you. You need Christ now, and you need more than to just know who Christ is and know the buzzwords. I said this past Wednesday night even, like in the first century, people knew about Jesus. People heard about Jesus. People in the first century even saw Jesus. But what did that get them? Because you can know all about Jesus, but not know who he really is. If you're not born again, if you've not placed faith in Christ, then your judgment is not idle. Your destruction is not asleep. It is not just for false teachers that have to worry of judgment. And if God did not spare the angels, if God did not spare the world, if God did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, Well, what hope do you have that he's going to spare you? And understand, Jesus will be glorified in your salvation, and he will also be glorified in your condemnation. But no, God is able at this very moment to cast you to hell. But sinner, he's able to rescue you as well. Because we know Christ has come to seek and save that which is lost In 1 John 1, 9, we're reminded of this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Noah and Lot, they were not perfect people. But they were sinners saved by grace through faith. So come to the Lord for rescue now, knowing that no one who has ever sought him has ever been cast out. 
Peter says that, that the time is rapidly approaching. Come while there is still time. Knowing that he's able to rescue the godly from temptation. That he's willing, that he's able to seek and to save. Knowing that he is more willing to forgive than we are to be forgiven. Now, like I said, you've all been given a lot of homework this morning. You've all been given an assignment. Uh, for the believers in the room, your assignment we know is this. You need to discern what is true. Which means your Bible study might need to be more than your verse of the day. If that's all you can get, which I don't think it really is, take what you can get. You need to discern and you need to declare the truth. Or if you're an unbeliever, your task is to embrace the truth. No one is leaving here today without one assignment. So which is it that you are going to do this day? It is all before you. Come and take it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we know that your word is truth, that uh, you have given us the sure word of the gospel, that you have given us your Son as the Savior of our souls. I pray that as we leave here today, we do have a desire and a, a really a need to discern what is true, to call the, the ace the ace and the spade the spade and uh, do all that we can to see that we are pursuing uh, the true word of God. We look at this world and we do see falsehoods and, and sin everywhere, but I pray that it would not be found in your house amongst your people. May we do all that we can to follow you in spirit and in truth. And Lord Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, this is a newer one. I know that all the talk of judgment, sometimes it can be easy to be discouraged. But this is a good reminder for us that, you know, if you look even at the world today, we're... Our salvation's closer to us now than when we first believed, and this is a good reminder in that way. But it's also a good reminder if you're getting a little antsy in your seat, hey, you almost get to go home because it's called almost home. So let's sing it together. Don't drop a single anchor, we're almost home. Through every toil and danger, we're almost home. How many pilgrim saints have before us gone? No stopping now, we're almost home. Promised land is calling, we're almost home. And not a tear shall fall, then we're almost home. Make ready now your souls for that kingdom come. No turning back, we're almost home. Almost home, we're almost on toward that blessed shore oh praise the lord we're almost home this journey ours together we're almost home unto that great forever we're almost home what song anew we'll sing round that happy Come fain of heart, we're almost home, almost home, we're almost home. So press on toward that blessed shore, oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. This life is just a babe. We're almost home. That sun is setting yonder. We're almost home. Take courage for this 
darkness shall break to dawn. Oh, lift your eyes, we're almost home. Almost home, we're almost home. So press on toward the blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. Almost. on toward the blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. Amen. Let's, uh, oh boy, maybe not. Let's pray together one last time and then you are dismissed. Heavenly Father, we look forward to that day when we will uh, see you face to face, where we will be uh, standing on our glorified legs and singing uh, redeemed and glorified songs and everything will be in key and everything will be in perfect harmony as we get to spend eternity with you. And while that day may not come today, we look forward to the time when it does and let us live with the hope and the assurance knowing that that day will surely come and we will see you as you are, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.